welcome. On this Thanksgiving weekend I want to get organized a little bit more and talk about uh, Morse and Lustenich Schneemann theory, something I have worked on 10 years ago with Frank Huselis. It has evolved uh, since and it's a beautiful area of mathematics because different parts of mathematics are involved. We have algebra, especially algebraic topology, we have topology uh, this comes in, for example, in homotopy deformations, and we also have analysis, which is when you involve functions, calculus, if you involve functions and critical points, and both theories deal with all three areas of mathematics. So it's very beautiful. Morse theory is a very powerful theory, but it, it only works for uh, manifolds. So we have to define what manifolds are in graph theory and uh, lustenich schneemann is much more general but still I think not appreciated uh, enough but it's a beautiful theory too. And everything I'm doing is graph theory, everything is finite. Uh, there's actually nothing new. I kind of have 12 statements here. These 12 statements are all known in the continuum and Actually, if you do a, take a graph and you take your uh, geometric realizations in, you know, some Euclidean space, you can actually derive all these things from the continuums. However, what I really uh, would like to have is, first of all, simplicity. And also we want to have uh, independence of the infinite. Sometimes we uh, refer to real numbers. For example, if you look at functions here, we we take values into real numbers, but this could be also taking values in the integers or the values in the rational numbers. But let me just quickly outline the, the definition. So there are two different kind of approaches to this link between algebra topology and analysis. Underlying geometric structures are always graphs, finite simple graphs. And uh, in this case, it's arbitrary. In this case, we've talked a lot about manifolds. A manifold is a graph like this one where every unit sphere is a n minus one sphere. So in this case, every unit sphere is a one sphere, is a cyclic graph for four or more elements. And uh, what we always assume if you talk about functions on vertices, we'll take locally injective functions. Which, and uh, so things make sense then like the poincare hoff index which is one minus the Euler characteristic of the stable sphere, then we have immediately from, the, almost from the definition of by induction, we have the Poincare uh, Hopf theorem, <coughs> uh, which links the Euler characteristic. Euler characteristic is defined for any graph using, of course, the Whitney complex, the set of complete subgraphs. This is a finite abstract simplicity complex, and you have uh, an Euler characteristic. So the Euler characteristic of a sphere is two, right, because uh, of the Euler gen formula, which you can also prove quickly using uh, induction. For the theory, we need a manifold structure, and then uh, one can define what a Morse function is. A Morse function is a function such that this stable sphere, all the vertices attached to the to a given vertex which where the function value is smaller, that's called the stable sphere, or the unstable sphere, both have to be spheres. So this is very nice. For example, if you have a barycentric refinement, then the sphere, the, the stable sphere joined with the unstable sphere is the unit sphere. The Morse index uh, of a Morse function is one plus the dimension of the stable sphere. So for example, if you have a minimum function which has a, a point which is a minimum then the stable sphere is is empty which is a minus one dimensional sphere and so the index is zero the morse index defines the poincare hoff index so this is quite restrictive so that's what morse had in mind you, you take manifold structures and you also have a restrictive class of functions uh, with which you can do calculus. So in the continuum, we assume that the second derivative is non-degenerate. You have only, this implies that there are only finitely many critical points on a compact manifold. And 
On the other hand, category th the Lustig Schneerman category doesn't make any assumptions. So this is true. This is all of these works for an arbitrary graph, an arbitrary network. And uh, so in order to define manifolds, we have to define contractible. So a, a graph is contractible inductively if you can take a vertex away, such that unit sphere and the graph without that vertex are both contractible. So you can build up graphs using uh, homotopy deformations and so So uh, a manifold is never contractible. So a manifold has, if you, you cannot take away any vertex, if you would take away a vertex, a unit sphere is a sphere, and the sphere is never contractible. Contractible graphs have other characteristic one, spheres have other characteristic zero or two. In the, in the category part, I put here also the uh, definitions of the cohomology. You can do that uh, in general for any uh, graph. And what you do is you take the set of complete subgraphs and then you take functions on it. In order to have differential forms, what you do is you orient each of the simplices. What you have then, what you can talk about, you can talk about the form, it's just a function on this set of sets to R. These are differential forms, and then if you restrict them to simplices of uh, dimension K, you have K forms. And uh, so, and then you can define an exterior derivative, which is a concrete matrix. Once you have, you know, the orientation is fixed, you have, also you can say whether uh, Y is compatible, a subset Y is compatible with X or not. If it's compatible, you take one, and otherwise it's minus one, that's this sign. And that's the exterior derivative. Uh, when you, uh, this matrix, this is a matrix, uh, M times M matrix, if you have M uh, simplices, and then you can uh, define a symmetric matrix, which is the Dirac operator, and then you can square it to get the Hodge operator. This decays into blocks, and you have by you have this uh, the, the dimension of the kernel is the Betty number. And actually, the kernel itself, this is what you consider to be the cohomology group. What is also nice, there is some arithmetic even coming in here. When you take graphs, you can, what I like about graphs is you can not only add them, this joint union, you can also multiply them. And when you multiply them, you get the ring, the Shannon ring. This is what our mathematics is. This is pebble mathematics. We have numbers one, two, three, then we define integers, we define rational numbers, we define real numbers, we define complex numbers, quaternions, octonions, whatever, all the functional analysis or whatever you need, you build up just, but that's just pebble mathematics. But if you start from the ground up with graphs instead of pebbles, you have a mathematics which is much more advanced and which is, has, you can do the same thing. You build up the uh, rational numbers, you build up analog of real numbers, complex numbers. So you have this uh, Poincaré polynomial, which is, uh, it's a nice ring homomorphism, which is nothing else than the Cunet formula. So this you can understand actually very well if you just work with the kernel, so you work with harmonic forms. Because what you have, what you have is a tensor ring. What you can do is you can just, if you on the product, you just multiply the, the forms. So this is called the tensor product. It's not, not commutative uh, product. But then you take the divergence d star, so the divergence which get, gets you from a k form, a k minus one form, right? The d gets you from a k form to a k plus one form, and uh, so the d star is just a joint matrix. It's just a the transpose matrices are right? zero, one, minus one matrices, right? So that's uh, uh, just a concrete uh, matrix. And then what you can do is you can define the cup product. What you do is you, you kind of take this product on the product graph and you just look at it on the diagonal. And uh, so this is now a operation which is commutative and it defines a K plus L form because we have just on this uh, divergence. This is something Whitney realized first, right? If you take a, if you take a, a function on uh, the edges, this is a one form, and you take another function on edges, which is a one form. So what you have is then when you take the tensor product, you have now a function on a trade row, right? Because it's the tensor product, but that's not 
uh, right, right, because you need a, you need to get a two form. So what you do is you apply the divergence, and then you have a function of triangles. Then you have a a, a, a two form. So that's how that's how you do the common algebra, and it's immediately then from this construction, the Kunit formula is immediately uh, clear because if f is a harmonic form and g is a harmonic form, then f is g is a harmonic form and d star commutes with l with this Hodge operator, <coughs> this Hodge matrix. <laughs> so it's very, very nice. And then you can define it. So you have this cohomology ring, which is now a, a commutative ring defined by the graph. So every graph defines a cohomology ring. And then you have the, the cup length is the minimal number of positive degree forms, which when you multiply them in that ring, which gives you non-zero. So this is the cup length. This Lusenich Schneerman theory deals with general functions which are local injective and not necessarily with Morse function, then the number have the number of critical the minimal number of critical points is Cre G. So this is an analytic notion, this is a calculus notion, this is an algebraic notion. Uh, CK is uh, in Morse theory was denoted the number of critical points of Morse index K. And, uh, and C is the called C of F and G is the number of the minimal number of critical points which a Morse function can have. So I think we have now all the definitions uh, which are needed in Morse theory, discrete Morse theory. Uh, by the way, that's not the same than the formal uh, notions of Morse theory. It's related, of course, but it's not the same. So this is, I think, much more kind of uh, teachable. And this is uh, all the definitions in uh, the Lucenich-Schneerman case. And now we can go and look at uh, theorems. So these are uh, one, so one is, uh, this is the strong Morse. <coughs> so the strong Morse inequalities are, I learned that first with a bit of deformation trick uh, in college, which is a, a nice, uh, you know, beautiful way to use any classical analysis to kind of relate what it does, it relates algebraic topology with, with uh, analysis with the number of critical points. So this uh, strong Morse inequalities you just prove inductively by building up the graph as a Morse complex. This is called the weak. Actually I like them very much because this allows you immediately to get the bounds of the Betty numbers from a concrete function. So just have, just have a and uh, three is just by adding up to. <coughs> if we add up all the B case, we get P. That's the total number of total Betty uh, number, and this is uh, C case, the total number of critical points. Because the Morse index, so this is nothing else than adding up all the Poincaré Hopf indices, and this is uh, this is the Euler characteristic. The category, the category of graph is defined as the minimal number of contractible graphs which you need to cover graph. For example, for a sphere, the category is two. You can cover it with two balls. For a donut, the category is three. You need three. There's an inequality which tells you that the cup length is plus one is a lower bar for the, for the category. And uh, for four, that's actually uh, very uh, simple to, to, to prove. So what you have is, so you have UK, this is the cover. You cover the graph with contractible sets. Now what you can do is you can take F is a, is a K form. <coughs> Find an equivalent form. You can say F plus DH is zero in U. Okay, uh, you can find an exact form dh such that f plus dh is equal to zero. Write f it, it, restricted to that, write it as a dhk, then subtract that. Of course, that's the same cohomology class, but it's now zero here. Now, in order to have the, for the five, to, to see that the category is a lower bound on the critical point, what you do is you just look at the Cinemax principle when you are. Uh, you cannot make it larger sets of category k. If there would be not a critical point, you could extend the 
the, the set a little bit without changing the notion of the, the, the category because it still would be contractable, you would get a contradiction. You can see almost by definition, 12 is interesting. And actually I'm still kind of thinking about this. So this is kind of still have, kind of what we do, what we have to do is we have to define, we have to have the right notion. So uh, yes, this still kind of uh, needs to be finalized, written down in a finalized way. But uh, I hope it gives you a little bit of an idea of what I'm thinking about at the moment. Mm -hmm.